on World News Tonight. Impending doom. Ukraine prays for the best but prepares for the worst as the country hopes to talk down Russia into cancelling its threats of invasion. However, citizens, untrusting of the country, prepare to defend themselves against any potential threats. More details tonight. Back in business. Canada's vital border trade route now ready for its usual commuters after a major cleanup effort from authorities who handled restless citizens protesting pandemic restrictions within the country. Tonight, the updates on the border rallies. Trilateral talks. North Korea came center stage in recent united discussions between the powerhouse countries following an alarming uptick of nuclear activity in the region. Will the talks successfully disarm the potential deadly strategies of the nation or will the efforts further fuel hatred and turn nuclear weapons? Find out tonight. Carnival Fun Nice is back with splendid displays in an event anticipated by many. The Festival of the King of the Animals kicks off with a bang. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with a look into the situation in Ukraine. Ukraine has called for a meeting with Russia and other members of the key European security group over the escalating tensions on its border. Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said Russia has ignored formal requests to explain the build-up of troops. He said the next step was requesting a meeting within the next 48 hours for transparency about Russia's plans. Russia has denied any plans to invade Ukraine despite the build-up of some 100,000 soldiers on Ukraine's borders. But some Western nations have warned that Russia is preparing for military action, with the U.S. saying Moscow could begin the aerial bombardments at any time. More than a dozen nations have urged their citizens to leave Ukraine and some have pulled embassy staff from the capital. It was reported that the U.S. was preparing to withdraw all its personnel from Kyiv within the next 48 hours. Washington reaffirmed its warning that Russia could invade Ukraine at any moment and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz prepared to visit both countries in a bid to head off a crisis that Berlin said had reached a critical point. Praying for the best, but preparing for the worst. This was no ordinary Sunday for the residents of Mariupol. The city is less than 50 kilometers from the border with Russia, making it a part of the de facto front line. In the capital, though, authorities were seeking to temper fears of a looming invasion. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky even going as far as asking his counterpart Joe Biden to travel to Kiev. That is highly unlikely given the increasingly dire messaging from the White House. According to U.S. intelligence, a Russian invasion is imminent. A dozen countries are now urging their nationals to leave Ukraine as soon as possible. We have seen over the course of the past 10 days uh, dramatic acceleration in the buildup of Russian forces and the disposition of those forces in such a way that they could launch a military action essentially at any time. They could do so this coming week. And as the new week begins, all eyes will be on German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who is traveling to Kiev first and then Moscow. Another attempt will be made to avert war by diplomatic means. But Scholz told reporters Western nations have a plan in place if Russia attacks Ukraine. Australia has also joined hands in responding to the heightened tensions in Kyiv as the country's embassy left the area with the situation on the Russia-Ukraine border continuing to deteriorate, with Prime Minister Scott Morrison calling on China not to remain clingingly silent on the crisis. Australia on Sunday said it was evacuating its embassy in Kiev amid a growing threat of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the situation was reaching a stage he called dangerous. He also called out China for not speaking out for Ukraine. That comes after Beijing criticized Canberra for hosting a meeting of U.S., Australian, Japanese and Indian foreign ministers last week. Chinese government is happy to criticize Australia for engaging in such peaceful activities, but yet remains chillingly silent on Russian troops amassing on the Ukrainian border. The coalition of autocracies that we're seeing, seeking to bully other countries, is not something that Australia ever takes a light position on, and certainly my government never has. 
The U.S. has also ordered most of its embassy staff to leave Kiev due to the deteriorating situation. And on Sunday, it sent more weaponry and ammunition to Ukraine's capital as part of a $200 million security package. Meanwhile, further south, Ukrainian security forces held drills aimed at cracking down on possible provocations at the border with Russian annexed Crimea. Russia's state-owned news agency RIA said the Kremlin had also begun naval exercises near the Crimean Peninsula. Moscow denies any plan to invade, saying it is maintaining its own security against aggression by NATO allies. India's recent controversial hijab ban has caused mass outrage within the country and around it as well, with protests erupting in Pakistan as the rule takes away from the freedom of Islamic women having to decide between things like education and religion. We have Abdul Nawal News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar who joins us now from Delhi in India for more. Gayatri. Yes, Shanali. About 250 women took to the street of Karachi to protest against a hijab ban in the southern Indian state of Karnataka as a row over wearing head covering in schools intensifies. The demonstration was organized by the Daughters of Islam religious group holding banners and placards protesters chanted in support of the right to wear the hijab. The protesters said the hijab is their right and that when all human beings have the right to live life according to their religion, their culture and their will, then a Muslim woman also has the right to wear the hijab and lead a life according to Islam that has given her this right. Karnataka reported that several schools had denied entry to Muslim girls wearing the hijab, citing an education ministry order prompting protests from parents and students. The government of Karnataka, where 12% of the population is Muslim and which is ruled by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, has said in an order that students should follow dress codes set by schools. Opposition parties and critics accuse the BJP government at federal and state level of discriminating against the minority Muslim population. Modi has defended his record and says his economic and social policies benefit all Indians. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. And that was Adha Dharanavalni, Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. Protests that broke out on the border of Canada have now been brought under control after heavy actions taken by authorities. The rallies, which were caused by citizens unwilling to accept particular tight COVID-19 restrictions within the country, caused a major blockage of a vital international trade route, which caused disruptions. Let's cross over to other than the World News Special Correspondent Joshua Samranaika from Ontario in Canada for more. Joshua. Yes, Shanali. Canadian police cleared protesters and vehicles that had blocked a vital trade route on the border with the United States, making some arrests. But the bridge was not yet open to traffic. The officers moved in after a tense standoff between Canadian police and demonstrators since Friday, when a court order and threats of arrest failed to end the blockade of the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, Ontario, which entered its sixth day on Sunday. Police stepped up their presence with more than 50 vehicles, including cruisers, buses and an armoured car, as the number of protesters dropped to around 45 from roughly 100. Windsor police tweeted, There will be zero tolerance for illegal activity. Detroit International Bridge Corps said in a statement that, The Ambassador Bridge is now fully open, allowing the free flow of commerce between the Canada and US economies once again. The crossing normally carries 25% of all trade between the two countries, and the blockade on the Canadian side had disrupted businesses in both countries, with automakers forced to shut down several assembly plants. The demonstrations have reverberated across Canada and beyond, with similar convoys in France, New Zealand and the Netherlands. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Atta Dharana World News Special Correspondent Joshua Samaranaika reporting from Ontario in Canada. Residents of Fukushima Prefecture held a rally against a plan to discharge nuclear contaminated water. Now, the dumping of nuclear contaminated water into the sea is an issue which is not only concerning Japan, but also concerning the whole world, creatures in the ocean, and also the food that is consumed. We have other than the world in special correspondent Anjali Vijayaratna, who joins us now from Fukuoka in Japan. For more, Anjali. Yes, Shanali. 
It's not just the international community that's against the plan to discharge the wastewater in the sea, but also citizens residing in Fukushima Prefecture. Protests were held in Fukushima, Iwaka City, where more than a dozen residents raised banners calling for the cancellation of the move while also demanding protection of the sea. The Tokyo Electric Power Company previously said that its plans to release contaminated water about a kilometer offshore through an undersea tunnel, but the plan did a little dispel the concerns of the local residents. Locals said that Japanese government and TEPCO have failed to pay enough attention to their opposition for a long time and they hope that more information will be disclosed during the upcoming IAEA investigation trip. So as to raise more people's awareness for marine environment protection. Last April, former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihida Suga said TEPCO would be allowed to release nuclear contaminated water from Fukushima into the Pacific Ocean starting in 2023, leading to a massive outcry from both local and international community. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Ada Therana, World News Special Correspondent Anjali Vijay Ratna reporting from Fukuoka in Japan. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight and we move on to the updates of the COVID pandemic around the globe. Thousands of Tunisians protested hours after President Kai's side officially replaced the Dujisha watchdog and gave himself powers to sack judges and ban them from going on strike. Thousands took to the streets of the Tunisian capital in protest against the president, who continues to tighten his grip on power. Kais Syed has again outraged his opponents by effectively taking control of the justice system. He's issued a decree that creates a temporary judicial council with no fixed term to oversee judges and remove their right to strike. The move also gives Syed the authority to dismiss, promote or nominate magistrates and he'll be responsible for proposing judicial reforms. The rally was organised by the moderate Islamist party, Anada, and members of a separate civil society group. The watchdog was seen as the final remaining institutional block on the president's powers after he sacked the government and suspended parliament last July before moving to rule by decree. Syed announced its replacement in a video posted on Facebook a week after saying he planned to dissolve the council, prompting protests and a nationwide shutdown of the courts by judges opposed to the move. Syed has long accused the council of blocking politically sensitive investigations and being influenced by the opposition. He says the decree was needed to save Tunisia from what he describes as a corrupt, self-serving elite that's damaged the economy and brought the state to the brink of collapse. The conservative contender in French presidential election, Valérie Precrisi, held what rivals and campaign insiders touted as a make-or-break campaign rally following a string of defections into Emmanuel Macron's campaign alongside criticism from her party's influential ex-boss, former President Nicolas Sarkozy. Walking on stage to face a sea of supporters waving the French flag. Valérie Pécresse is hoping to give her campaign a much-needed boost. In her first big rally, the right-wing presidential hopeful took swings at Emmanuel Macron and outlined her vision for France. I believe in freedom. I fight against domination. And I am warning you, I will never accept the subjugation of the Republic. Marianne is not a veiled woman. The event comes at a tough time for Pécresse, having stagnated in recent polls. While this week, her lay Republican party was rocked by a string of defections to President Macron. The deserters include former budget minister and party heavyweight Eric Burt, former ministers Catherine Vautrin and Nora Berra, and the mayor of Calais, Natasha Bouchard. They're also close allies of ex-president Nicolas Sarkozy, who has so far failed to give Pécresse his formal backing. Despite the setbacks, supporters at the rally remained optimistic. Pécresse personally describes herself as one-third Thatcher and two-thirds Merkel. Since 2015, she has been the regional president of Ile-de-France, 
demonstrating a technocratic, pro-business and pro-Europe leadership style. All of the four main contenders in South Korea's March 9th presidential election have registered their candidacies ahead of Tuesday, which is the day they can officially start hitting the campaign trial. Ahead of what thought, attention in focus on whether the two conservative candidates will unify their campaigns, a move that, if realized, could be a game changer in a tight race to the finish line. The much-discussed possible conservative bond merger has been publicly acknowledged as being on the negotiating table. In an emergency briefing on Sunday, People's Party's Anchor Su highlighted the need for a strategic alliance in order to achieve the people's demand for a change of government. To do so, he proposed unifying candidacy with the main opposition People's Power Party's Yoon song yeol whereby the two candidates decide on an ultimate runner in a public opinion poll. Ahn had initially ruled out the possibility of a merger, but shifted his stance just 24 days ahead of election day. The People Power Party largely welcomed the idea of merger itself, but raised concerns over the proposed method, saying that holding an opinion poll may trigger division among the opposition bloc, which could be an advantage for the ruling Democratic Party rival Lee Jae-myung. Yoon echoed the party's sentiment. In fact, the party's chairman, Lee jun Suk explicitly ruled out a primary as an option, citing Yu leading on in the polls by a large margin. Instead, he called on An to voluntarily pull out of the running. With the two sides at odds over how to move forward, any actual merger could take some time. The best scenario would be to come to an agreement before the 28th when ballots are printed, so that the changes could be reflected on paper. Watching developments will be the DP's Lee Jae-myung, who has pushed for forming a coalition government with An. Lee, when asked about whether the plan is still valid, refrained from answering directly. The DP has so far not given any official comment as it closely watches events unfold, given the major impact a conservative merger could bring to the current neck-and-neck -neck race between Lee and Yoon. Meanwhile, the minor progressive Justice Party's Kim Sang-jung expressed regret over An giving into big party politics. In a trilateral meeting that just wrapped up South Korea, the United States and Japan condemned North Korea's missile tests and called for the regime to return to dialogue. The top diplomats met in Hawaii also discussing issues related to Ukraine and the Taiwan Strait. The chief diplomats of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan have condemned North Korea's recent series of missile tests while reiterating their calls for dialogue and diplomacy. South Korea's Chung Woo-yong, Anthony Blinken from the U.S., and Japan's Yoshimasa Hayashi met in Hawaii on Saturday local time. While the U.S. made it clear that sanctions will continue, Blinken stressed yet again that the U.S. has no hostile intent. In a joint statement, they called for full implementation by the International Community of UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea, calling the regime's activities unlawful. Not just missile launches, but the North has recently signaled a possible resumption of nuclear and ICBM tests. Sources say the South Korean side suggested to the U.S. that additional measures be taken to engage with North Korea, but they did not disclose further details. While emphasizing trilateral cooperation on the matter, they also reaffirmed three-way cooperation on economy, Indo-Pacific strategy and the role-based international order. In the statement, they emphasized peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, an issue that's sensitive for China. Also discussed were the ongoing tensions over Ukraine, adding that the three countries are committed to working together to deter further Russian escalation. Along with the U.S. Secretary, the ministers from South Korea and Japan agreed on many other issues, including cooperation on Myanmar and ending COVID-19, but there were things on which they could not quite see eye to eye, historical issues. Chung met separately with Hayashi before the three-way meeting, where he expressed strong regret over Japan's push to get the mines on the Japanese island of Sado listed as UNESCO World Heritage, despite Koreans having been subjected to forced labor there by Japan during World War II. 
Chong also called for Tokyo to retract its curves on key exports to South Korea, while reiterating Seoul's stance on Japan compensating the Korean victims of its use of wartime forced labor and sexual enslavement. Despite these thorny issues, the two sides reaffirmed their intention to cooperate to restore people-to-people -people exchanges to the pre-pandemic level. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. India's Space Research Organization launched three satellites into the lower orbit of the Earth at an altitude of 529 kilometers from Satish Dhawan Space Center along the eastern coast. The main payload was the Earth Observation Satellite, a radar imaging satellite for the high-quality pictures to serve agricultural purposes, forestry and plantations, soil moisture and hydrology and flood mapping. Hundreds of people protesting against New Zealand's vaccination mandates on the lawns of the distinctive B Hive Parliament entering their seventh day of demonstration. Claiming inspiration from truckers' anti-vaccine mandate demonstrations in Canada, the protests started as a stand against vaccine mandates but now have been joined by groups calling for an end to COVID-19 restrictions. The Los Angeles Rams rallied late to beat the Cincinnati Bengals 23 for 20 on Sunday to deliver a Hollywood ending to Super Bowl, securing the franchise's first championship since returning to the West Coast six years ago. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with spectacular visuals of the Nice Carnival, which started once again under the theme King of Animals after the 2021 edition was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Stay safe and have a good night.